Galapagos Islands are located approximately 600 miles off the coast of Ecuador. They are unique due to the geographical conditions of the area. The islands are the result of what has been described as a volcanic conveyor belt, that is, a hot spot or thin layer of the Earth's crust situated on a plate which is in constant movement, effectively generating volcanic islands and moving them down the line from the hot spot, effectively creating a train of islands. When it comes to the Galapagos, these islands drift from northwest to southeast, the newest islands being at the top and the oldest, most eroded islands being at the bottom. The Galapagos also happen to be serendipitously situated in the middle of an intertropical convergence zone, where the Humboldt, Peruvian coastal, Peruvian and oceanic, Cromwell and South Equatorial currents all come together. Southeast and Northeast trade winds also converge on this site. It is believed that these currents and winds are what originally brought the fauna to the islands in that they were rafted there after significant storm events. Due to the lack of fresh groundwater and thus mostly inhospitable nature of these islands, the species that we find surviving on them are there due to very important adaptations they managed to evolve. The history of settlement and human interaction in the Galapagos is one of survivalism that rarely turned out well for the settlers, and then one of plunder on the part of seafarers, such as in the case of the land tortoises. Easy to catch, rich in fat and nutrients, with a shelf life of up to two years when stacked up live in the galley of a ship. One of the most important visitors to the islands in terms of contributions to modern science was Charles Darwin. In 1835, his research vessel, the HMS Beagle, landed on the islands. His observations of the unique fauna, the finches in particular, lay the groundwork for his breakthrough theories on evolution that would eventually be popularized in his tome, The Origin of Species, which would describe how natural selection worked to create specific adaptations as those seen in the beaks of his finches. Each beak, unique to the food source, it was adapted to take advantage of. In the last century, after a short stint as a penal colony in the 1950s, the Galapagos were declared a national park and in 1978, UNESCO made the islands a World Heritage Site. Since that time, it has become a wildlife tourism hotspot, which has brought in good revenue for conservation efforts, but also posed great challenges as it caused increased risk to the unique ecosystems of the island. After being placed on UNESCO's list of sites in danger in 2007, great efforts were made to correct for those issues, and just this year, the site was taken off the list due to those advances, such as increased enforcement against illegal fishing and greater control over the number of tourists allowed to visit each year. The greatest draw for tourism to the islands is the unique fauna, otherwise known as the iconic fauna of the Galapagos Islands. There are 11 remaining subspecies of the Galapagos tortoise, as four are now extinct. These tortoises can grow to be over 500 pounds and can live to be as old as 150 years. They are foragers and rely on grass, leaves, and cactus. The Galapagos tortoise was able to adapt to the rough conditions on the islands primarily due to their ability to survive up to a year without eating or drinking. The different subspecies found throughout the islands have their main differentiation in the shape of the saddle of their shells. Tortoises living on larger, higher islands with more grasses and lower vegetation have a more rounded shell. Tortoises living on drier islands, which were more dependent on the cactus for their sustenance, evolved to have a saddle shape that was dependent on how tall the cactus grew. The taller the cactus, the taller the saddle on the tortoise's shells evolved to be, allowing the tortoise to reach up higher with their necks to get to the vital food source. People who took them and stockpiled them as food for their long voyages decimated the tortoise populations. Later, introduced an invasive species such as dogs, pigs, rats, and goats became a threat to both the turtles and their reproductive success. 
a species that previously had no significant predators, entire egg clutches could now be destroyed by a single foraging animal. The Galapagos tortoise is an endangered species, but at the Darwin Research Station, an active reproductive program has had success in breeding all but one subspecies. Lonesome George is the last of his kind. Many researchers have tried to get him to mate, but as of yet, there has been no luck in doing so. That is the uh, adaptation corral outside. Out there, you see, all of them are mixed, different subspecies, different edges as well. Food is going to be found every week in a different place, so they have to learn to find their food on their own. So they are training now to survive in a while. Mm -hmm. After that, uh, depending on the subspecies, they will need three to seven years to be big enough to avoid predation by these introduced predators. Then they're... Going to the highlands of Santa Cruz to see the giant tortoises was one of the experiences I was most looking forward to as a visitor to the Galapagos. The realization that these creatures have survived some of the worst threats to their extinction was only part of their appeal. Gently approaching the giant creatures, seeing the texture of their skin, seeing their eyes, and knowing they will live longer than I will ever hope to, it was like communing with the ancient. If you did happen to move too quickly, they would let out an exhaustive gasp and recoil their necks back into their shells. If you were quiet and still, you might be lucky enough to see them extend their neck into a stretch that seemed almost never-ending. With the conservation efforts of the team at the Darwin Research Station, I hope they will be roaming these mountains long after we are all gone. There are two main types of iguanas found in the Galapagos. The marine iguanas, which subsist mostly off of the vegetation found in the ocean, and the land iguanas that subsist off of vegetation found on the land. The land iguanas are fairly large and grow to be about 25 pounds and can live upwards of 50 years. They are predominantly yellow, although their coloring is distinctive for each subspecies of the islands, as well as having other morphological variations such as backspine. They sleep in burrows in the ground, and they eat mainly cactus fruit, flowers, and pads, but have been known to be opportunistic eaters, including some insects and even carrion. Some species have spiny backs with bright yellow and rust coloring, while on other islands they are more smooth-backed with dull yellow coloring. The marine iguanas are the only iguanas known to subsist on oceanic algae. Their main food source is red and green algae. They can dive as far as 50 feet underwater for up to a half an hour. To be able to take advantage of this food source, they have evolved a very special adaptation. The excess salt in their bloodstream is filtered by a gland in their nasal cavity and is expelled through the nose in a sneeze of sorts. In this way, their bodies avoid problems due to excess salinity. Most of the year, their skin is a dark slate gray, 
but during mating season, their skin color changes to brilliant red and green, possibly a sign of reproductive health. Due to their cold-bloodedness, it is common to see large colonies lumped together on stones, gathering body heat for the foray ahead or regaining it after their brief swims in the ocean to eat. I was lucky enough to be able to observe the marine iguanas eating underwater. They are slow moving, with an undulating swim, crawling over the rocks, munching on the green and red algae. Small fish come to nibble by their mouths as they tear off pieces of the vegetation to eat. The Galapagos Islands really are a bird watcher's paradise. The islands are home to many endemic species found nowhere else in the world. The Galapagos Archipelago is populated by many diverse species including the iconic blue-footed boobies, the Darwin finches, the Galapagos hawk, frigate birds, waved albatross, Galapagos penguins, and flamingos, just to name a few. The frigate birds were the regular companions of our boat, constantly soaring over the sun deck. They are the only birds that regularly steal their food from other seafaring birds. The species is well known for the males that have a red pouch in their neck that they inflate during mating season. One of the most popular birds of the Galapagos is the well-known blue-footed booby. The body being brown and white, these birds are known for their brightly colored blue feet. The males show off their feet in mating dances with prospective partners. They stand an icon of the islands which can be found in any tourist shop in the region. My first evening on the boat, I was able to catch an entire flock diving in in unison after a school of fish. These birds are very photogenic, as are the young chicks.
The older, more eroded islands are nesting grounds for waved albatross. These giant birds have a wingspan of over seven feet. Pairs mate for life and have complex and endearing courtship behaviors. The sex of the chicks is dependent on whether the eggs are rolled or not during the incubation phase. The Galapagos Islands is the only area in the world where you can see penguins living alongside flamingos. The flamingos rely on saltwater ponds for their habitat and as such are only found on islands with those characteristics. Because of this, they are more susceptible to changes in climate. They feed primarily on brine shrimp that gives the birds their flamboyant pink colors. As a visitor to the islands, I was most impressed by the Galapagos penguins. They are endemic to the islands and are thought to have originally been brought there by way of the Humboldt Current, which they currently depend on for the influx of cold water. They are the rarest species of penguins on Earth and are currently endangered. Threats above their naturally occurring predators include introduced and invasive species, as well as loss of food supply and endangerment from illegal fishing activities. I feel honored to have been able to swim with them, watching them preen themselves and hunt for fish. They truly were a delight to watch. The Galapagos sea lions are ubiquitous with the islands. When our tour group first encountered them before we even boarded our boat, we all took out our cameras. Our naturalist guide warned us, don't take too many pictures, you will see so many of them you just might be sick of them by the time we leave. Well, we did see many, many, many more, but I never did get sick of them.
The Galapagos sea lion is related to the California sea lion, but is its own distinct species endemic to the area. They are most agile in the water. These curious and social creatures have many features that can easily be anthropomorphized. While snorkeling, they would swim right up to us, almost poking our masks with their noses, turning at the last moment, egging you on to play with them. If you were not interesting enough, they would move on, but if you were a worthy partner, they would twirl around you awaiting your response. The Galapagos sea lion diet depends mainly on sardines, a bounty of which is infused by the nutrient-dense cold Humboldt and Cromwell currents. In years of the El Nino flow, when the cold waters and their associated nutrients are reduced, the sea lions lose this vital source of food as the numbers of sardines are greatly diminished. Each territorial section of the beach is ruled by its own beach master, the dominant male in control of the area. These bulls are substantially larger and can weigh up to 800 pounds. They fight for dominance with aggressive displays of barking, pushing, and biting. The beach master constantly patrols his area, defending the females from the competition and keeping everyone in check. Due to this behavior, displaced males sometimes form bachelor colonies. In the late summer, there were many new pups seen on the beaches. The mothers will spend up to three years raising their young. Other icons of the islands are the Sally Lightfoot crabs. These colorful red, yellow, and blue scavengers are found all over the islands. I was mesmerized by the beauty of the spotted eagle ray so graceful as it flies through the waters. The snorkeling was truly enjoyable with many tropical reef fish, several white-tipped sharks, and many green sea turtles.
A popular site to visit is Post Office Bay, where it is traditional to leave your letters. Other travelers picking up messages directed to those close to home, delivering them by hand to the recipient. I sent two letters when I was there, one to my parents in Washington, D.C., and one to myself in Toronto. My parents received their letter in just two weeks, whereas I am still waiting for mine. In Puerto Arroyo, you will find the Darwin Research Center, several dive shops and souvenir shops, an internet cafe, and a fantastic cevicheria. Significant threats to the island's unique ecosystem include illegal fishing, pressures due to tourism and immigration to the islands, threats from introduced and invasive species, conservation management issues, as well as threats from global warming. Initiatives are now in place to help control invasive species, including reducing access points such as airports and marinas. Local boats are equipped with monitoring devices, making it easier to identify and apprehend those participating in illegal fishing in the area. Tourism poses its greatest threat in the expansion of land-based tourism, which is largely unregulated. Proposals are being considered to strictly limit the capacity for land-based tourism, as well as limit the number of park passes issued. Hopefully, with these initiatives and continued monitoring, the Galapagos Islands and its natural inhabitants will be conserved for generations to come.